Israel has one of the most technologically advanced militaries in the world. And in the past, the country's use of that murderous technology was guided by human judgment. Not necessarily good judgment or moral judgment, but human judgment nonetheless. But it has now been revealed that since October 7th, Israel has been letting machines decide who lives and who dies in Gaza. And the consequences of exchanging moral complexity for robotic simplicity have been even more deadly. Lavender is the ironic name of the AI machine that has been directing Israel's bombing spree in Gaza. This is coming from 972 magazine in a joint investigation with Local Call. And they say algorithms have marked tens of thousands of Palestinians for assassination with little human oversight and a permissive policy when it comes to collateral casualties. The investigation is based on military documents and the testimony of six intelligence sources who have served in the army during Israel's assault on Gaza. According to the report, the AI machine is used to identify potential members of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad before putting them on a kill list. It does this by making use of the massive Israeli surveillance system already in place in Gaza. This slide is from an IDF intelligence lecture given at Tel Aviv University last year. The system is fed information about people already identified as Hamas members, the inner circle, and extracts certain common features. These features are then used to identify other suspects, the outer circle, by assessing which features they have in common with the original group. Individuals assign numbers, which represent the degree to which those features are present. For those of you who are aware about the workings of the Met Police's gangs matrix, this will sound quite familiar. These features include, among other things, being in a WhatsApp group with a known militant, changing mobile phone every few months, and changing addresses frequently. And clearly, those are the kind of features that lots of people with no real connection to Hamas could share. Lavender then uses that information to rate Palestinians on how similar they are to Hamas fighters. That produces a rank, and those who score above a certain threshold are targeted for assassination. But the threshold appears to be incredibly arbitrary. One senior intelligence source told 972 this. In a day without targets, whose feature rating was sufficient to authorise a strike, we attacked at a lower threshold. We were constantly being pressured. Bring us more targets. They really shouted at us. We finished killing our targets very quickly. The source also said this. At its peak, the system managed to generate 37,000 thousand people as potential human targets. But the numbers changed all the time because it depends on where you set the bar of what a Hamas operative is. There were times when a Hamas operative was defined more broadly and then the machines started bringing us all kinds of civil defence personnel, police officers, on whom it would be a shame to waste bombs. They help the Hamas governments, but they don't really endanger soldiers. Got that line. It would be a shame to waste bombs. Also remember, this is a military that is directed by a a government who have called said everyone in Gaza can be a Hamas operative. That is the information they are feeding to this AI machine. These are the algorithms. Algorithms are programmed by humans. They're not independent. They are completely controlled by our own biases, by our own perceptions. And that's what's being fed into Lavender. Now, despite knowing that Lavender returned a wrong result, even by the standards of what the IDF consider a mass operative, around 10% of the time, 972 reports that the IDF had little interest in using human resources to verify its targets. The same senior intelligence source said this. A human being had to verify the target for just a few seconds. At first, we did checks to ensure that the machine didn't get confused. But at some point, we relied on the automatic system and we only checked that the target was a man. That was enough. It doesn't take a long time to tell if someone has a male or female voice. I would invest 20 seconds for each target at this stage and do dozens of them every day. I had zero added value as a human apart from being a stamp of approval. It saved a lot of time. If the operative came up in the automated mechanism and I checked it, he was a man, there would be a permission to bomb him subject to an examination of collateral damage. One of the most obvious flaws of a system like this, beyond the fact it is completely disgusting and murderous, is that it also completely misunderstands the nature of a resistance force embedded in society. A second source told 972 this. How close does a person have to be to Hamas to be considered by an AI machine to be affiliated with the organisation? It's a vague boundary. Is a person who doesn't receive a salary from Hamas but helps them with all sorts of things a Hamas operative? 
Is someone who was in a mass in the past, but no longer there today, a Hamas operative? Each of these fe- features, characteristics that a machine would flag as suspicious, is inaccurate. I mean, again, this is a military that has literally justified going into a hospital and shooting healthcare workers because they might be Hamas um, as something that's totally fine. And now they're using these machines to make killing decisions. It also creates a further mechanistic dehumanizing attitude amongst the military and it outsources moral responsibility to a system that has no morality, no guilt and no regret. A source who used Lavender told 972 this. There was no zero error policy. Mistakes were treated statistically. Because of the scope and magnitude, the protocol was that even if you don't know for sure that the machine is right, you know that statistically it's fine. So you go for it. There appears to be an approach to killing innocents that was seen as a feature of this software and not a bug. And this is the senior intelligence source again. It has proven itself. There's something about the statistical approach that sets a certain norm and standard. There's been an illogical amount of bombings in this operation. This is unparalleled in my memory. And I have much more more trust in a statistical mechanism than a soldier who lost a friend two days ago. Everyone there, including me, lost people on October 7th. The machine did it coldly, and that made it easier. (sighs) Once Lavender had identified targets, 972 reports that a second system was used to maximize the chances of killing them. This is where it gets really disgusting, because this system is called Where's Daddy, and it's a tracking software linked to Israel's mass surveillance system inside Gaza. Rather than having to hunt for a marked target throughout Gaza, the IDF links each target to their family home. Then, all the IDF have to do is wait. That's because Where's Daddy automatically alerts the IDF when a person put on the kill list by Lavender enters their home, which is then bombed. But who else is likely to be in a family home? Women and children, of course. A source who had been an officer in a target operation room told 972 this. Let's say you calculate there is one Hamas operative plus 10 civilians in the house. Usually these tents will be women and children. So absurdly, it turns out that most of the people you killed were women and children. So far, over 33,000 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza and over two-thirds of them have been women and children. If 972's investigation is correct and Israel is deliberately killing entire families out of convenience, it goes a long way to explaining that grotesque statistic. And according to IDF sources, Israel exercised no proportionality in authorizing large numbers of civilian killings. 972's Operation Room source told the magazine this. It's not just that you can kill any person who is a mass soldier, which is clearly permitted and legitimate in the terms of international law, but they directly tell you you are allowed to kill them along with many civilians. Every person who wore a mass uniform in the past year or two could be bombed with 20 civilians killed as collateral damage, even without special permission. In practice, the principle of proportionality did not exist. According to 972 sources, American pressure has led the IDF to moderate its attitude to civilian casualties in recent months. And in a statement, the IDF denied much of what was said by 972 sources, writing this. Each target is examined individually, while an individual assessment is made of the military advantage and collateral damage expected from the attack. The IDF does not carry out attacks when collateral damage expected from the attack is excessive in relation to the military advantage. I mean, that's not really a denial, because that is complete subjective. Just go back through that again. Each target is examined individually. Well, all the sources said, yes, we individually, you know, do the box tick, but we weren't really checking it. And they said the IDF does not carry out attacks when collateral damage expected from the attack is excessive in relation to the military advantage. Who's assessing what the military advantage is there? Who is assessing whether it's worth it? Who has raised Gaza to the ground saying that it's worth what happened October 7th? Conclusions. Earlier today, I spoke to Noel Sharkey, Emeritus Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics at the University of Sheffield. I began by asking him whether this is a watershed moment for the use of AI in warfare. I think it looks like a watershed moment. We've been looking at these systems and how they've been developing for some time, but this is the first time we've actually caught explicit use. I mean, they may have been used before in Syria. There's no way of telling But this seems to be very clear from the report we've both read that that it is the case that it's being used. What would that mean, though, for future conflicts now that it is open knowledge that this sort of AI 
is being employed. It could be a watershed moment in another sense. Maybe we'll see the devastation and harm this has caused and stop it. We've been fighting for a new treaty to stop this at the UN since 2012. Okay, so a long time. And it always seems to be getting somewhere, but then somebody vetoes it every time. So we can we never get there. But maybe this will push it forward a bit. You mentioned a treaty that you've been working on since 2012. Who was the we that you're talking about there? And what is that treaty? In 2012, Um, I got together with a number of other NGOs like Human Rights Watch, Pugwash, Amnesty International, a group of of, uh, NGOs. Uh, I wasn't in an NGO then and and talked to them and we decided to formulate a campaign. We had a lot of Nobel laureates in the team as well. And we started, launched a campaign called Stop Killer Robots. Okay. So Stop Killer Robots campaign began in 2012. In 2013, we had our first UN meeting, and we've had at least two meetings at the UN every year since then. It's become a a usual thing at a committee called the CCW, which is there explicitly to prohibit certain weapons, you know, like gas, bombs, uh, laser bombs, those those kind of things, uh, landmines. And so we wanted a a new treaty that would prohibit the use of killer robots, we called them, but autonomous weapon systems. In other words, systems that could target someone and kill them without human intervention. So you've been involved in this long campaign to stop killer robots, but we are now seeing killer robots being employed in a really devastating military campaign in an occupied territory. How likely is it that the rest of the world will pick up this call instead of simply picking up the tech for themselves? It's only a few people who are blocking it. Um, The United States, Russia, the UK, Australia and Canada are the main culprits for blocking this. Most of the world is in favour of a prohibition treaty to stop it happening. It's the high-tech nations who don't want to stop it. They think it can be useful. But let me just say one thing is, this is not killer robots being employed here. It's It's a jagged system that could be, might as well be killer robots. But it's this um, this system called Lavender uh, provides the targets to a human and they check if it's male or female, that's it. And then they pass the targets to another system. Um, I think there's one of them called Where's Daddy? And all that system does, it tracks the target, that tracks the target's home. And when the person comes home, it alerts the military that they've come home. And so then they bomb the house, killing the entire family with the person. They always bomb a house. That's what the system works on, identifying. Now, the bombing strike can be five or six hours after the person's been spotted going home. So frequently, I should imagine the target isn't even present, but there'll be lots of women and children there who will be killed. Israel is a hugely militarised society that has a massive reliance on technology. Obviously, the lavender system that we've heard described is, is really terrifying and massive questions about moral Uh, conduct there. But what are some of the other pitfalls that happen when you're in this really deep reliance on technology like this? My concern from the very beginning, I think I wrote my first article on this for The Guardian in 2007, and the same issues remain. My concern then was that it was against the laws of war, what they keep referring to as international humanitarian law. That's what our government here called them. Uh, And that the Israelis are not living up to international humanitarian law because a machine, well, they're very cold for a start, but but how, how well can they discriminate targets? So you're not supposed to kill civilians. That's the first thing. You can kill other uh, combatants or combatants, but you should never kill civilians. And I say never. There's a circumstance in which you can kill civilians. So the the law of war I'm talking to is the principle of distinction. The other law, 
which is equally important, is the principle of proportionality. So any killing that you do must be in direct uh, proportion to military advantage gained. So if you're killing a very lowly foot soldier, it's not you can't really kill another civilian at the same time. Whereas what the Israelis are doing are killing up to 20. They've got permission to kill up to 20 people for a lowly person. Uh, and for a commander, they would be able to kill 100 or so civilians or as many as it took, essentially. And this is this is the problem with all of these weapons. Can an automated system be proportionate? No, because they're not. Nobody even knows what proportionality is. It's a human judgment made by a commander on the ground. There are PhDs written about this in military academies. It's quite ridiculous to think that an AI system could could work on a decent law of proportionality. And they're not very good at discriminating it either. And even if they could, do we really want to be, you know, a matter of life and death given to a machine? I don't. Lawyers have also warned that the use of AI might complicate future individual prosecutions uh, on human rights crimes, whether in this war or in future ones. Why might that happen? A lot of it's got to do with the chain of command and responsibility. Who's responsible when an AI system goes rogue or goes wrong and starts killing? Supposing, a, I mean, a system like this could get a, if you... At least there is a human there in this one, but you could have just as easily have it directly connected to drones that would often did the killing themselves. And that's where it becomes really dangerous because what if a group of drones just suddenly starts, you know, the, there's a bug in the system. You, you've worked with computers. I'm sure everybody watching this obviously has worked with computers and you know they crash and go wrong a lot. Supposing it goes wrong and they just run off and, and run rampant and start killing lots of people. Who's responsible for that? It would be so easy to say, oh, the machine went wrong. Sorry, we, we fixed it now, rather than pick, and it, whereas it could be an evil human who's just doing this. So it's very difficult to work out exactly who is responsible and accountable. Normally in military situations, a commander is responsible for everything. And I've given a lot of talks to the military, talks to you know groups of generals and things, and they all quite concerned about the use of these weapons because they say, I know where the responsibility will probably stop, and that will be with me. So commanders will have to be responsible. But even then, I mean, if you if you use one of the people have talked about putting black boxes in them to ensure that, you know, you could look back and see what who's done what. But it would be very easy to just blow the machine up afterwards and destroy the black box. So that's the kind of, it's about accountability and responsibility. It becomes trickier. As a long-time campaigner on limiting and regulating the use of autonomous weapon systems, what do you think it would take to get the high-tech nations like the UK to back more regulation? The problem is that we, we started off uh, calling for a preemptive ban on the weapons. In other words, before they have been developed, uh, because we found out there were lots and lots of US documents and British documents talking about the development. So we were trying to get in there and get a treaty before they started, because once you've spent billions of dollars on them, how do you get them to stop? Um, and that's that's been the problem all the time. So what might help um, is to have examples. For instance, when they were campaigning against landmines, they had pictures of children with their legs blown off, you know, all kinds of nasty injuries. Whereas in our campaign, we're just talking about a future that some people at the beginning, especially Russia, said, why are we bothering talking about this? Because it's never going to happen, although they're they're in massive development themselves. So maybe when we get more examples and see more, and I don't want that to happen, but maybe that will wake people up. At the moment, we have progressed. We've taken it out of this CCW, which was a swamp where anybody anybody at this UN committee, anybody, can veto the whole process. And at the moment, Russia's vetoing every single meeting. So we're not getting very far that way. But what we've managed to do is to get it to the General Assembly now with the head of uh, Guterres, the head of the UN. 
Uh, so it's in the General Assembly now where every nation can vote on it. So we're hopeful there. But I, I'm not overly hopeful having spent so long there. Uh, to begin with, I was totally optimistic. We got in quickly. We had momentum on our side. Lots of countries were saying, yes, we should ban these immediately. Um, and then especially the Latin American countries, they were really good. And the African countries, all the people who would be victims of this, essentially. Um, but then suddenly we find out that it just takes a three or four nations to block the whole thing. So we've just got to keep fighting them and, and publicly shame them. That's the thing. Once you've got examples like is this example now, um, we can use that to shame people and say, look what could potentially happen. And these are not even fully autonomous. There's a human there, but the human isn't doing very much.